Hi, welcome to the Generations of Wealth podcast. I'm Derek Dombeck, here with my business partner and co-host, Jeff Shehusky, and our guest today, Jeff Watson. Howdy, folks. As you might notice, we're not in our office. We're uh, in a, a different office uh, with palm trees and oceans and probably some people walking back and forth behind us. But we are uh, going to have a topic today. Jeff was was making suggestions of, you know, what what's something current that's that's really on your mind? And what do you think, Jeff? What should we talk about today? I like the idea of talking about myths that are currently being publicized in the real estate investing community, designed to mislead people and um, separate them from their hard earned money. Okay, so for those that have never heard of you, Jeff, why should anybody even care about our opinion or your opinion? Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Well, thank you. Um, I'm hanging out with two of my better friends and great clients, Jeff and Derek, or Derek and Jeff, whichever way you want to call it. Um, and I'm an attorney licensed to practice in the state of Ohio. I've been doing it for about 32 years, been a real estate investor since January of 1994. So I've seen a few market cycles and I'm privileged to represent and advise some influential companies and people in the real estate investing space. And I have been able to accomplish a few different things from some different perspectives. And, you know, probably the fastest way to do a real deep dive on me is check out my blog, WatsonInvested.com, WatsonInvested.com. So why don't you listen to the podcast, take some great notes, because I'm sure all three of us are going to share some great content with you. And then since you already know these two guys, um, check me out when you're at your convenience and figure out if I know what I'm talking about. Well, that sounds good. Um, why don't we start with uh, the monkey in the middle here, Jeff? What do you think one of the biggest myths in uh, real estate is? So one of the biggest things, uh, for those of you that know us, right, we run a hard money lending company. And that's probably the thing that we're the most famous for. And we get a lot of people that come in um, thinking that it actually takes money to do deals. Um, and while that's true, it does take money. Uh, it doesn't have to be yours. And so, so many people think they got to have a million dollars in their checkbook before they can get started in this thing. So my first question is, is Jeff, what are some other strategies that people can use that are legal uh, when done properly, you know, using proper, competent, um, uh, professionals that, that they can get going and get started doing this stuff. So I, I'm going to re I'm going to ask if your question is ways of people being able to legally and properly buy real estate as an investment without using a bunch of their own money. Yes. Okay. That will absolutely cover the gamut. Okay. So there's obviously several ways and there's a way, there's two ways I'm going to talk about very briefly, just touch on them that don't involve the hard money lending that these mm -hmm. two distinguished gentlemen do. One of them is buying properties subject to the existing mortgage. And there is a way to legally and properly do subject to transactions. And if I had to talk about it, I could talk about it for the next 10 hours um, because of all the different nuances, insurance, taxes, structuring, trusts, all these things, powers of it, all that stuff in there. So there's, there's a way to do it. The second way to do it, for those of you that are worried about the mythical due on sale, I shouldn't say mythical, but you're worried about the due on sale clause. There's a kinder, softer, gentler way of violating the due on sale clause than subject to. And that is to structure a master lease with option on the same property with the same seller. So there's two ways of getting into a property with very little money out of your own pocket. What it is going to require is an investment of in between your ears. It's going to require an investment in between years. You're going to have to get educated and getting education in the real estate space is like going to a buffet. You've got to learn what dishes to skip and what ones to load up on and skipping the ones that make it sound all easy and so simple. Forget those folks. The ones that are feel make you feel slimy. Skip those folks. The ones that won't tell you about the stuff that they've done wrong and the holes they've dug themselves out of, skip those folks too. And then you're left with a pretty small pocket. That's the stuff you want to load up on in the buffet. It's interesting you put it that way because the whole premise of generations of wealth is 
passing on not only you know financial and, and assets to your next generations, but it's passing on the knowledge. And so our peers and the people that we've spent time around throughout our career, you know, yourself included, we've always sought the people that were, were teaching and speaking, not because they were trying to make money off of it, but because they were passing the torch. Right. And, and that's, and there's a massive difference and you should be able to figure it out pretty quickly. Um, you know, as to who's, who's primarily an educator and who's someone who's wanting to share to raise the level in the industry. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So now, I'm going to, I'm going to make one other comment, Derek, because what we're passing on with generations of wealth, what you guys have started here is we're not just passing on the assets, we're passing on the information, but we're also passing on the relationships. Correct. Correct. And, and the example I would give for that is, you know, having our children getting to know the other children of our peers and our friends in real estate. That was one of the mistakes and I'm very vocal about it. So I tell people that the, my biggest mistake in the first half of my career was I, I had no network and I was a closet investor. I didn't tell anybody what I was doing and what call it shame, call it call it just embarrassment because everybody was looking at me, wanting me to fail, waiting for me to fail so they could kind of point the finger and say, I told you so. But passing that that generational wealth in knowledge, but the network, um, man, if our kids can, can have a network in their teenage years, early 20s that we didn't get until we were in our 40s and 50s, there's nothing they can't accomplish. Correct. Absolutely correct. Yeah, and that's the that's the one thing that get your kids in soon enough, folks. And folks, this is this is where not where I thought we were going to go with this, but I'm going to say this: get your kids into this soon enough that they can build relationships with your peers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then it'll make it so much easier for them to do deals and build relationships with your peers' children mm -hmm. or grandchildren, and execute strategies and deals that way. And that's a myth that we should dispel because many people think they can't start when they're 18 years old, 19 years old, hell, 15 years old. You know, we're, we're here on a mastermind right now and there's a, a couple here whose children, um, both still in their teenage years, one has not graduated school yet, both make more on their real estate assets than their teachers do. But it was because of what we just talked about, the relationships. Um, right. You know, when, when they found a property, they were able to reach out to their parents' private lender. And the private lender was willing to lend to a 15-year-old child. Mm -hmm. Right? Of course, the parents are overseeing everything. But, but that's a myth. And le a legally, myth. they have to. Legally, they right. have to. But from a maturity responsibility standpoint, that 15-year-old knows the burdens on them mm -hmm. and they know that, Hey, whenever I got a problem or a question, there's a network of people I can go to. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's That's a, so powerful. It's a huge myth that I think people automatically assume I don't, I have to go to college. I have to save a whole mm -hmm. bunch of money before I can start. I, you know, there's a lot of excuses, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's definitely a myth. Yeah. So I'm going to introduce a myth that I want to talk about. Um, and I'm going to back it up with this. I bought my first investment property in January of 1994. I still own it to this day as a rental property. So I have been dealing with tenants as a landlord, as an attorney for landlords, and as an attorney for tenants for 25 years or more. Getting close to 30, actually. Another year and it's 30. Wow. So I'm, there's a myth out there. And whenever I hear this myth, my radar goes off, my red flags start waving and so on. And that myth is, and it's very carefully nuanced, it's, oh, the tenant will pay for the property. That's only partially true. The tenant will only pay for a part of the property, hopefully more than 50, 60, 70% of the property. But if you're going to be a landlord, you've got to be able to find some other cash solution for when the tenant doesn't pay, when a pandemic hits, when divorce hits, when cancer hits, when job changes hit, when economy changes, when taxes go up, when an insurance claim occurs, when a fire occurs, 
hey, I've been through all those things. When life happens. When life happens, because we know it's going to happen. Now, yes, you can minimize that by good, careful tenant selection and screening. And we've got some friends like Chris with Automated Landlord that are really good at that stuff. But even those tenants don't pay for 100% of the rental property. So don't fall for that myth of, oh, I'll buy something and I'm completely no longer responsible because I'll get tenants to do it all for me. No, that won't happen. You're still going to be on the hook, but the tenants are going to help you carry a lot of that burden. Well, and the one that, that bothers me a lot is when people buy something subject to. Yep. And yes, the, the barrier to entry is lower. You may be able to get into that with very little out of your pocket. If, if maybe nothing out of your pocket. If you've got negotiating skills like you, you can do it with nothing out of your pocket. Yep. But, well, thank you for that. But the reality is you damn well better have reserves. You better have a way to pay that note off if it gets called due. So... Sure, you might be able to get into it with zero money down or zero money out of your pocket. That does not mean you get into this without zero or without money or at least access to money. Access to money. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, when you start doing that, my mind automatically thinks to a individual out there on the speaking circuit right now teaching sub two. And I've done this with my own eyes. I've checked the court records and they've got 108 foreclosures on their name because they just they just didn't have the reserves and once it snowballed they just quit and ran from the country and all sorts of stuff so anyhow yeah yeah and, and that that really is a, i know you can't talk about your cases and people in general but you know knowing what we know and honestly real estate investing among the the scrupulous investors is a pretty small network across the country it's a very small network and and if you start doing people wrong it spreads like wildfire. It does spread like wildfire, a prick, especially among people with integrity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those people who have integrity, and it's 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 not a huge pool. Yes, there's thousands of us, but if you think about the hundreds of thousands of people who want to be in the real estate space, <clears throat> there's a lot of them who don't have a track record. Great, fine, God bless you. Go earn your track record, build it with integrity, go do that. Then there's a lot of people who they'll sell their own mom. They'll stab anybody in the back for an extra 500 bucks on a deal. Man, you'll do that to me one time and forget you. I'm not interested ever again. Oh, for sure. And that's where we're so careful about, you know, even the content we put out on this show, we, we never want to have anybody on our show or that we interview that, that we don't have at least a, a good working relationship with or, or an intimate relationship with that we know there's no ulterior motives or, you know, fake news coming across, right? This, <laughs> no this fake news. This yeah. isn't CNN. This is, yeah. So. Uh, well, fake news is on more than just one channel out there, but I don't watch any of them, so I don't want to name yeah. them. Yeah. There, there may be some listeners to this podcast who uh, I, I don't need to upset, so we'll just yeah. leave yeah. it at that. Yeah. But, but uh, I mean, fake news is everywhere. So cool. you've got, and you've got to exercise discernment. You really do. So I got a question about fake news. Uh oh, okay. Not the fake news of the media per se. Oh, okay. Right. But since we're on this topic of talking about the myths of what's going on. Okay. Bad things happen to good people. Correct. The majority of bad things that happen to good people, at least in the real estate space, seems, in my opinion, to happen because they get taken advantage of by fake news, i.e., gurus with less than stellar ethics and morals. But they're really, really smooth talkers and they're fantastic salespeople. So how can a, an investor today who's trying to expand their portfolio, right? I mean, we're going through some troubled times as an economy and people need these new alternative ways to be able to buy and to continue to grow safely or at least as safe as possible. How can we help them identify the charlatans, the, the fake news? you know, supposed gurus that are out there? Well, there's a couple of things that come to my mind. Uh, the first is trust your gut, but not your greed gland. Trust your gut, but not your greed gland. If you have a significant other in your life, particularly if you're a guy, listen to her. She has got a sixth sense that you as a guy don't have and I'm going to tell you, when I was married, <clears throat> there were a couple of deals that I did where the mother of my kids was like, no, don't do it. And I ignored her. 
and it was it was a disaster. And then um, my whole investing career changed because she elbowed me in the ribs three times and told me to go buy this one course that you know changed. And we pivoted everything we did off that one course. So listen to other people that you trust. So listen to your gut. Listen to other people that you trust. Do not listen to your greed gland. Now, one more thing I'll tell you. Use a search engine other than Google to dig into that guru's background. Don't use Google. Google can be manipulated. Use a search engine other than that. Maybe DuckDuckGo, maybe Yandex, something else out there and dig for them and run their name, his or her name, and just see if they have any issues with the SEC. Do they have any issues with foreclosure? Do they have any issues with lawsuits or judgments or anything like that? Just run those searches and see what shows up and then evaluate that because yes, you're going to have people. There are people out there who don't like me. There are people out there who don't like some of my best friends and people that I love doing deals with. That's fine. And if they've got a legitimate grievance about it, I want to see if I can re reconcile it. But there's people out there who don't like me because I tell the truth and they don't like my version of truth because my truth is pretty accurate. Okay. But just find out why they're, why this stuff shows up in their newsfeed, why this shows up in the search results and evaluate it. But if somebody is trying to tell you and they get you all emotionally engaged and they're telling you how easy it is and how much money you're going to make and they don't tell you about the work that's involved. They don't tell you about the sacrifice that's involved. They don't tell you about the education you've got to get and keep working on. They're not telling you the whole story. And I start backing away from those folks. I mean, part of it that, that really trips my, my hot button is when you've got this dog and pony show, right? The, the lights, the, the loud music, the, the, you know, the smoke machines, the smoke machines, <laughs> bringing everybody up on stage and, and flashing a thousand checks across the you know the screen showing testimonial checks and not that that doesn't have some viability to it and and i get it it's marketing but most of our peers that, that we really enjoy spending time with you don't know what they have you know they're not flashing the jet or the lambo or the or the mansion whatever right it's if you even know they had a closing, it was probably just by accident because you were having a conversation or like, oh, I, I bought a property last week. Right. It wasn't it wasn't out there for the whole world to see. Right. Now, I have nothing against people that want to do that on social media and they, they post their closings and stuff. That's got some merit to it for for, um, you know, for marketing purposes and getting your name out there. But when it's a guru that's that's up there, that turns me off. And it should. And I can think of specific examples. I've got one client that said to me one time, a former client said to me one time, hey, you remember seeing so-and-so on social media with this big check with two commas in it and a crooked number before the comma? He goes, yeah, most of that money was mine. They wanted the closing where I didn't get paid until after they had a check for that big for their, for their marketing. Mm -hmm. And then I got my money, which was most of that check. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's and, a and I'm like, and I'm hearing that from the lender who's like, they let it go on. And, you know, I'm not going to mention any names. I can't even tell you where in the United States that took place. But that's the kind of stuff that bothers me is because we always have this emphasis on gross instead of net. Yes. And if you know anything about the three of us, we are focused on the bottom line net after legally avoiding as many taxes as possible. And that's what really matters because it's not about how much we're making on the top line gross number. It's about what's the net number after taxes that we then get to use for lifestyle, deploy back into our businesses and grow with that. Well, and you look at top line, bottom line myths, um, how many people are competing with high wage earners that are just buying properties that don't cash flow because they need the tax advantages of it. I mean, that in and of itself to me is kind of a myth. Um, I don't know what you guys feel about that, but I, I would never buy a property, whether I was trying to shelter a whole bunch of income or not. I just, I don't have it in me to go buy a property that negative cash flows, period. I will pet a baby alligator. <laughs> just a baby alligator. For a short period of time, huh. waiting for some more appreciation, 
waiting for me to be able to get the rents up there a little bit. I'll pet a baby alligator for a year or two because I know I've got enough coming in from elsewhere mm -hmm. that on that one house or those couple, I can pet that little baby alligator. When I say an alligator, folk, that's that's slang in our industry for a deal or a house or property that's taking and consuming more than it's generating. I'll pet that baby alligator for a year or two, but then I want to get rid of it and I want it to be cash flowing. So you actually had a sort of a key statement in there. Sort and, of a key statement. Yeah, yeah. because <laughs> the the thing that people have to realize, though, is that you've been doing this for a while, right? And, yeah. And investors that haven't been around the block long enough, they will take on those types of deals because someone said so or yes. because they saw someone else do it, say, like yourself. Or they read in a book that somebody whose wife had a property with $10 a month positive cash flow and they thought was a fantastic deal. Yeah. And, you know, experience matters, time matters. And, and especially when you're early on, that's where a lot of these myths come in because that's how good people get burned is you're comparing, right? Oh, comparison you even, is such a thief. Yeah. You, you don't even realize that you actually just picked up a, a, a pet alligator. Right. And you don't realize that that gator is going to grow into something bigger and not just, you know, maybe nip the tip of your finger. It's going to take your finger off or your whole hand. I've had a quicksand deal that just about took all of me once. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that that was actually a pretty key thing you yeah. said about how that was playing out. Well, but and but it's, it's the experience that you've got and it's the fact you've got other cash flow coming in from other performing properties that you've managed and built. Yes. So you know what it needs to look like. So you know where you're going. Correct. Well, and the other beauty of it is, is once you have experience and you have a network, when somebody else's pet alligator gets away from them and grows, mm -hmm. we come in and we turn that alligator into a new pair of boots or a purse. Yep. But that comes with experience. That comes, but there's got to be some pain realized yeah. to let that pet alligator become a pair of boots. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So I think. The other side of this and the direction I want to take this to is a myth that two things. Number one, you're told build a team, right? Like every everybody that's selling any guru stuff out there is saying, if you're a beginner, build a team. I don't disagree with that, but the myth that you have to build this big team, build this big buyer's list, um, all these different things before you can actually be successful versus my belief of build a network of people like we have now that, that you can truly trust. Mm -hmm. You know, like the example I would use is I had a team early on when I started in the early 2000s that I built. And when the markets crashed, my team was gone. I mean, because mm -hmm. they either got fired, they went broke, they got arrested, that happened. Um, you know, things, things fell apart. That wasn't, that might've been a team but it wasn't a network. Right. Right. So, you know, we're here in Mexico right now at a mastermind, like this is building a network. Mm -hmm. Talk about the difference to you guys. I'll let you go first on that one, Jeff. Um, boy, I, you know, it's kind of one of those things that a friend of mine, Jim Ingersoll is famous for a statement of your net worth is your network. Mm -hmm. And, that is such a true statement because when, when you start having an issue with anything, it doesn't matter if it's a deal you're trying to buy. It doesn't matter if it's already under contract. It doesn't matter if you already own it. The network are the people that you can turn to that will give you good, solid, honest guidance and advice on how to move forward and how to get through something. More often than not, team members are there for a commission check. Uh, they're, they're there for some sort of a profit and the money is the only thing that keeps them there. When you build a really valuable network of, of fellow investors who have had some form of success themselves, it's so much easier to work through things and not run into a wall with it. Uh, a really good network of people will pick you up. Right. Yes, and they will. You've heard that before. You know, we're all trying to climb the ladder. That's great, but you're trying to do it on your own. And sometimes you get tired after you make a couple of rungs because you have to pull your own body weight up. But it's so much easier if someone else who's a little bit further than you just reaches down and gives you a hand and pulls you up. 
And that's what the difference between a team and a network does for you. So, you know, masterminds are critical. Real estate investor groups, right? The RIA is important to hang out in, uh, going to conferences and, and different events and just really getting to know people from all over the place. It's just powerful. It's very powerful. And I'm going to I'm going to piggyback off of that with this concept of who should be in your network. And maybe if your network only I'm going to say this, if your network only includes members of the buy and breathe generation and real estate investors, <laughs> um, you don't have the right network. When I say buy and breathe, if your network is only composed of individuals who have been buying real estate since 2012 till now, the last 12, 13 years, last 11 years, whatever. My math sometimes a little fuzzy here in Mexico. Um, they don't have the experience of going through downturns and digging out of it. They don't have the experience of seeing how other people can restructure a deal and dig out of it. I've only been through three downturns. And the people I'm looking to the most right now are people who've been through four, five, and six downturns. Because I want to make sure that I'm not making any mistakes that they're avoiding. And I want to learn from that. So if you, you know, get your network, yes, absolutely agree with it. Uh, but make sure your network includes people with a lot more experience than you so that you're not within a, uh, you know, confirmation bias echo chamber. And the other part I want to make pretty clear on network is the way Circle of Trust is set up. Our mastermind is we, we bring people from all over the country. Like we don't have people from our hometown in our groups with each other. So there is this atmosphere of, of being a hundred percent open, honest, vulnerable, nobody's in competition with each other versus if you join a mastermind or, or a coaching program or something that is geared more towards um, just increasing your bottom line or your net worth or how many deals you do or, you know, there's a vulgar term that I use that I won't use right now, but there, it's a it's a contest. It's a measuring contest of assets. And those can lead you down a very wrong path mm -hmm. unless that's what you're looking for. The problem is those groups and I'm not going to name any of them either. And I've spoken in bunch <laughs> spoken to bunches of members of them. Um, they're not measuring the right thing. Right. They're measuring the number of transactions they're not measuring what is the net change on your bottom line. And I've got a, a dear client that lives down in southern part of Florida, fantastic business operator, a six, built a successful business, hit the Inc. 500 with it two years in a row, sold it off. Now he's teaching and, and coaching in a different area. And he's like, if you're not measuring your net worth every 60 or 90 days, you're messing up. And it's not looking at the number of deals you're doing. It's looking at how, how much is hitting the bank account. How much are you paying down debt? How much is going into your 401k? How much is going into your IRA? How much is going into savings? How much is doing this? You know? And the other focus that we have here is how much is it changing your personal life or affecting your personal life, good or bad? Yeah. Yes. You know, <laughs> oh, yes. How many people are out there being told you should have 100 doors or 1,000 doors? or 10,000 doors and damn the consequences. Mm -hmm. The consequences very quickly can turn into divorce and, you know, illnesses and early death and we, the, go on. Right. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. I mean, we all have, we all know people that have seen their marriages fall apart because of too much work in real estate and other things. I know people who've lost their health mm -hmm. over spending way too much time chasing deals and not taking care of their health. And to me, that's one of the silliest things that I see, Amer particularly Americans do, is spend so much time, effort, and energy on building wealth just to turn around and spend that money on trying to get their health back. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're going to wind this down. Um, Jeff, for anybody that wants to get a hold of you, you, you mentioned your, your blog earlier. Um, yeah. You do have a, a training course on subject to purchasing right now that, that you are um, yep. doing. Talk about that briefly, reiterate how people can get a hold of you. Sure. Um, the course I have is called Serious Sub 2. It can be found at the website of SeriousSub2.com. And the reason I named it Serious was because there's just so much bad, incomplete, false information out there about Subject 2 transactions. 
and I'm watching people out there just who have no depth, no knowledge, no character teaching this stuff. And I'm like, that's nonsense. Now, are there some other good people out there that teach it? Yes. Don't think ever, don't think I'm trying to put everybody down. I'm not. Okay. I'm just like, okay, I want to be serious. I want to teach people to do this the right way because if you know me, if you've done your due diligence on me, you'll find out that I've got a lot of experience working in the governmental and regulatory background, making it easier for real estate investors to do what we do. So I know what CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, thinks about land contracts. I know what state division of real estate think about how to enforce their brokerage laws and definition of broker where it relates to wholesaling and how you do deals. So I know these things, and I'm also trying to pass some legislation in Washington, D.C. regarding seller financing. So I take all that knowledge that I have of hundreds of meetings on Capitol Hill and all sorts of other places, and I've built it into how I structured this course with content that I'm not afraid of someone asking me questions in front of a news camera on Capitol Hill about what I teach in that course. It's full on honesty. It's full on integrity. That's why we call it serious. That's why I bring in one of the best tax attorneys I know, John Heyer, to talk about these things. That's why I bring in a brilliant marketer by the name of John Cochran to talk about how to get deals the right way. All that's inside of Sirius Sub 2. You can get it at SiriusSub2.com. And if you're like, well, dude, I don't want you to sell me anything. Great. Then how about let me give you something for free? Go to my blog, WatsonInvested.com watsoninvested.com and you can sign up for the free email newsletter that I write twice a week and yes I write it no chat GTP no artificial intelligence it's me and uh, these two guys read it so maybe it's worth reading it so get that free email newsletter it's worth exactly or more than what you paid for it all right awesome um, if you are interested in talking to Jeff or myself in regards to some of the things that we have going on uh, we host the Circle of Trust Mastermind, so anybody that thinks that might be a good fit, reach out to us. Um, we we are always willing to talk to anybody about deal structuring. We are lenders. If you have questions about borrowing or you have questions about how you could be a lender yourself or how you could invest with us to become a lender, uh, reach out to us. So you got any closing thoughts, Mr. Shahusky? Well, other than the fact that you forgot to give them how to get a hold of us. I was going to do that. All right. I'm just making sure. Uh, yeah. So um, really, we're here to be a resource. I mean, that's the reason why we started doing the podcast. That's that's why we started bringing in friends like Jeff Watson to start talking about this stuff is, is there's just a lot of misinformation out there. And I, I think there's a lot of people that just need some clarity brought to them. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for help, that's really all this is about and what we're here for. So now you can go ahead and just give them our website. Well, our parent website is going to be bestreifunding.com. G-O-W-Voyage.com is the website for Generations of Wealth Conference. R-E-I-C-O-T.com is the website for the Circle of Trust. All of these should be in the show notes. After, as this gets sent to you and we just appreciate you being here um we will have one live generations of wealth video podcast a month and then more of these just content informational podcasts as we see fit so please like this share this send it out to any anyone that you know that you believe this could be a help to and we look forward to bring you more great content on the next one Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, being, it's been a privilege. Being, I, I couldn't sit in the middle. I didn't want to be in a Jeff sandwich, just so you all know that. Have a great yeah. day. Yeah. <laughs>